what I thought I'd do today was to talk a little bit about uh, how we in business schools are, the sustainability challenges, how we see them. Uh, also about the research and teaching that we're doing with the companies that we work with, how companies really are approaching the sustainability challenges that we have. So if I start out here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention a whole bunch of different types of sustainability challenges that I know many of you recognize, that many of you uh, not only recognize, but also probably have much more deeper maybe natural science uh, knowledge about it. What we talk about, of course, there's uh, basically no doubt that human behavior has led to climate change. I think, uh, you know, going from uh, whether, you know, the, the libertarian discussions about whether or not the, there is climate change or not, I'm very glad that in 2015, at least, we're not really discussing that any longer. The big discussions is really on how do we deal with them. And that there is a lot of debate on, uh, of course. Uh, if I think about climate change, I think also about the wonderful ice watch that Ulliford has outside of, of Paris. But I also think even further, uh, because I think about the consequences. I think about the consequences in terms of human beings. Uh, the human beings that, of course, we all know that with climate change and the melting glaciers, we're having rising sea level. But what does that really matter for many people? Well, for many people, that matters actually in and enormous changes in their livelihoods and lives, uh, not least of all having to move from the, the islands that they live on, for example. I think about biodiversity loss, and I think about how bi the biodiversity is so intricately linked with our human well-being. Health, food security, energy, being more vulnerable to uh, the climate changes, uh, all of this matters so incredibly much to us, but it matters not only to us, but it matters most definitely to business. Uh, I think about, we talk a lot about in the business schools about population and urbanization. We know that we will be two to three billion more people in the world by 2050. Think about that. Where we have, uh, we know, I mean, it's, it's just such a simple uh, equation of thinking that right now we have one planet. If we don't believe that we can, you know, do a uh, move to another planet or at least have the technology right now to do that, we have one planet and we're already using, overusing the planet's resources by 50%. And we're going to be two to three billion people more. What does that mean to you and me? What does that mean to businesses? We talk about urbanization. We are now more than, I think it was last year, that we know that there's more than 50% of the global population that live in cities, live in urban areas rather than rural areas. What does that mean for us? Well, you know, you have the congestion. We know there's a lot of social issues that come about, not just environmental issues, but social issues with the fact that we are many more people living in cities than in rural areas. Uh, we talk about a lot about poverty and income inequality. This is a photo, I think uh, many of you have probably seen this from Sao Paulo, where you have poverty, such enormous gaps in living welfare in the exact same place. This is a photo where living next to each other is these enormous differences. Is that a matter of just justice? Not necessarily. This is a very big matter on, on economics as well. And that's why we talk a lot about how will countries continue to be able to grow if you have an enormous proportion of the wealth being created among a very small minority of the world and when you have another group who have much less to consume moving, if we take, take it from that perspective. Um, we have, as you all know, conflict and migration. You know that there's 60 million people who are living as refugees or in refugee situation. We have more conflict going on in the world, and this is also very much of a sustainability challenge. 
Uh, we talk a lot in business schools about uh, sustainable growth. Not only we in business schools, but obviously also in the media and with politicians talking about sustainable growth. We talk at the same time about whether or not we need a socioeconomic system change. The system, the socioeconomic systems that we have today, you could say in some ways that perhaps if they have led us to where we are today at a, a form of precipice for human development, do we have the right systems? If we have systems that are only built on continued growth, either it, either it is in GDP growth as we normally measure it, it is in consumption, you and I feeling that we are more successful if we have more, basically, if we have this whole system built on that, how conducive is that to the sustainability challenges we have? And thus, among most politicians who talk about sustainable and green growth, we'll be talking very much about, so how do we make reform the current systems that we have today and make them a little bit more sustainable? Let's clean up, let's find eco-technology, eco-innovations. We have the right system, but we need to make it a little better. The question is if that's going to be enough. And there are quite a lot of people working in sustainability and all sorts of different sciences questioning whether we need to start thinking in a very different way. Maybe we need to, you know, maybe in a, in a lot of a lot of us discuss that the financial crisis that we had in 2008, that was a real missed opportunity. We could have built totally n different systems here that were built on a much more sustainable basis. Uh, so there's a lot of these types of discussions going on in business schools and in the research that we do. Uh, another thing I think that uh, we talk a lot about is if you go back to you know, when this whole t idea of the nation state, that companies have their legal jurisdiction, if you're a Swedish company and you have your headquarter here in Stockholm or in Sweden, your you are responsible within that legal jurisdiction, Sweden. The problem is, and, and it's not a very you know, old phenomena, it's actually only back to 1648 with the Peace of Westphalia, where the nation state was, we, we would argue, the nation state was founded. But as you know, climate change, migration, transnational companies, how well does that work? If we are to measure what we do in Sweden, which is great, how well, given that the, the, climatic, the climate changes, biodiversity loss, the migration issues, they're all global. They don't care about the nation state in that way. What do we do? How do we do with that? Well, thus, we're living in a time where the COP meetings, where the UN, the multinational norm-setting networks are starting to become more important than a nation state, because we need to have global transnational laws for this. And this is so, you could say that the businesses in a sense are operating in a period where it's very difficult, it's very confusing, it's very ambiguid, ambiguous to what is right and wrong and you know, which norms are we going to follow, which laws are we going to follow, because we're living in a time where it doesn't matter what the laws are in Sweden versus the laws in the US or in India. We need to find something that is more holistic. Uh, what I do think is fantastic is that in September, the UN, through the UN, with a whole lot of work, we, the 17 sustainable development goals that will have taken over after the Millennium Development Goals and are focused on towards 2030. Were, be able, were even able to be established. Now, there's a lot of discussion on these goals, whether or not, you know, how linked they are together, uh, what they matter, but what we see is that the businesses are really taking off on how will we engage with these different goals. Sitting, standing here in Sweden, I know, and especially in the whole of Europe, I would say, in the Western world, the environment has always been the most important part of that. When you look at the Sustainable Development Goals, however, you'll see that they're much more based on the social side. And I find that also very, <laughs> very fascinating uh, a lot of times because it really does, if we think of a reality 
uh, perspective. It's also very often understanding and interpreting or sense making is very much within the context that you see it from. In my world, where I've worked a whole lot with poverty alleviation, I see much more of the social issues as important. That said, very many of the most of the social issues and the environmental issues are very intricately linked together, obviously. Um, so, if we take the traditional view on sustainable development, including both the economic side, which I would argue that companies have been much more interested in, if you think about the profitability and, and shareholder value, et cetera, et cetera, they have, if you think about all annual reports, they're all focused on the economic side. Uh, the environment and the social side, very often we kind of group them together into the society, basically. All of them matter. Who does it matter? Well, we have lots of different stakeholders to a sustainable development. We have the policy makers that we read a whole lot about who, who are going to make the regulations and the laws that we need and that need to be cross-border, cross-national here. You have civil society who have become a much more, uh, I would say, uh, strategic with how they work. They've also become much more, they've grown, not least of all. Uh, they've become much more legitimate within the, w both with business and with policy makers. Uh, and I think that's really wonderful because I think you need all of these different cornerstones within a democracy. You have academia. I think academia has been very slow to, to the table in a lot of it, especially from a business school perspective. I'm very happy with the direction that the school is taking on this, that it is becoming very much more of uh, embedded with all of the different courses, with all of the different learning. We cannot get away from the context of the sustainability challenges we have today. Either you're working with marketing or you're working with finance, organization, or, or economics. So we have an enormous stake in it. Media, obviously, um, but really, 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 you and me, all of us, whether, whatever we're working with, you, we are, as long as we have an impact on the society we live in, and as long as that society has an impact on us, we are all stakeholders in sustainable development. Finally, uh, wanting to look a little bit at, uh, how am I for time, by the way? <laughs> okay. Because um, I could go on and on. <laughs> um, business is more and more, not only recognizing their own impact on sustainability or the sustainable challenges that we have. I think they're also uh, recognizing that they have an enormous responsibility. Not least of all because with the resources that companies have, not only the money but also the competencies and technologies they have, that they have, it, it's not just a question of uh, short-term profitability either, it's a question of being able to survive as a successful company, that they have to be able to engage in these questions. How companies are doing that, well, you know, I'm an academic, so I have to bring with me at least one graph here. <laughs> um, one way of thinking about, about it is if you think on the one hand side, the, the vertical line, thinking about potential benefit to, because companies are very much working out of this side idea that we have to find these win-win situations where we can be doing both good to society but also to our shareholders. Right? So if one thinks about in terms of how can we find, you know, there's, you can find lots of criticisms to this as well. We'll do that in the next session when we talk about the philosophy behind here. Um, but if you think of terms of companies doing a win-win, we're going to do good for society, we're going to do good for our shareholders. Um, and you think about outside of the core activities. And I, what, all of what I'm talking about here is beyond you know, the minimum requirement of it being legal and that you can actually survive economically on this. Right? So above that line. Um, but if we think about it, then we think about you know, the typical philanthropy. 
good causes. Let us donate money to good causes. And you have good examples of this. You have personal philanthropists like the Gates Foundation and Buffett. You also have a whole lot of corporate citizenship. We all know this. Most of the bigger companies give money to good causes. That's great. It's good for employee loyalty. Uh, it's good for company marketing brand, PR. There's, uh, you know, that's great. It's great. It does add value. The question is, is that we believe also that looking at how the company makes it mo its money is one of probably the more, is more important than integration. Um, you can think in terms of, uh, if you think in terms of modern philanthropy that has come, you know, there's a definition from Rockefeller from way, way back, and it was basically this idea that I can't help myself, I walk a lot. <laughs> um, modern philanthropy had this idea that basically every person, every you know, resourceful person should give back to society according to their conscience. Being a good person, giving back, doing as much as you can. But with that type of thought, it's also don't tell me how to make that money in the first place. Right? So if you go to the companies, we would say to the Bill Gates, okay, but could Microsoft have given back even more to society if they had looked much clearer through how they made their business? Looking through all the negative and positive impacts that they had from their activities within their organization. Uh, so a lot of companies, I would say, have started taking that first step. We know, you know, for a long time we know that if you're a co company building something and you're polluting in the air, you're going to have to pay for the cleanup of that. That's called negative externalities. That's something that companies have for sure started taking responsibility for. It's a little harder from the social side because uh, the question also becomes where do you draw those boundaries for what you're responsible, for what you caused, versus what society caused or what have you. What some companies are doing is taking uh, what we say much more of a life cycle perspective, much broader perspective. I'd like to think, I'd like to ask you, if you take your cell phones, how many of you have an iPhone? I have an iPhone myself. We're, also, we're in Sweden, which is one of the biggest markets. Quite a lot of you have an iPhone. <laughs> how many of you have thought a whole lot about where it came from, how it came to be in your hands. Where does it come from? Some of you are thinking about it. Where did it come from? Where did it start? Sorry? From your husband. <laughs> That's a little bit like hearing my son telling me that it came from me. <laughs> how many of you think about the conflicts in Congo the fact that s some five million people have died over the mineral conflict uh, or the conflict minerals uh, situation in Congo since '98, five million people have died because of that. That's very intricately linked to all of our digital equipment that we use every day. And where does it go after that? Well, you've heard about all the the situation with the migrant workers in China, 250 million migrant workers without basic human rights in China. 250 million. First, second, and third generation migrant workers. Where does it go? Well, we buy it or from your husband who probably went to a store and got it there. Where does it go afterwards when we don't want to use it anymore? Travels the world. Lots of them that go back to China to be picked apart for parts. Right? And then where does it end up? Lots of it ends up in e-waste landfills in Africa. It travels the whole world around. This is something that companies are working very hard with, looking at what they call circular economies. Let us look at the products that we use and look at the whole way around. But that means stepping out of your own company and your own direct operations. It means starting also to take responsibility for your suppliers and also to your customers, in a way. Drawing out the boundaries, much more so. Um, where we believe that we have the highest impact 
in companies is when you're actually extending from your own core activities. And we, there we talk a lot about product innovation, business model innovation, and ne not least of all at the base of the pyramid. Uh, some examples here, and I had to bring up the beautiful little sun that Ulufa has. It's a good example of that. The whole idea is that we, and here you have the life straw that purifies water. What I find, uh, you know, really especially fun with these examples is that there's a whole lot of examples that have been designed for a very different need in a very different context. We have to remember that if we're six or seven billion people in the world today, most of the products that you and I are used to have been designed to those very few people at the top of the pyramid, to the way that we use products, that we're used to having a plug to plug in electricity, or we're used to having running water in the tap that we can drink, right? But the situation is very different for those four billion people living at the base, what we call the base of the pyramid. That means innovation. It means fantastic innovation and thinking in all sorts of different ways. These products, I think, are very fun because they are also products that were designed for the base of the pyramid, yet they have a usage, a very interested usage, also in the West. We can bring in the, what we call re-engineering. The, the little sun is something that we, could, we <laughs> could use for all sorts of different things here in the West. The water purifier is being used by people hiking in the mountains in the West now. There's a lot of these different examples. I've visited a whole lot of different or schools in developing nations, and given the, the um, challenges that they often face in pedagogy when you have children at different ages who are just learning to read or who are uh, kids who are bought out of bonded, uh, bonded labor, contracts, um, the innovation that has gone into effective learning pedagogy is just, it, it's dumbfounding, it's fantastic to see. And these are things that we can learn and use back here in the Western world, I think. Uh, finally, we have uh, what we call business model innovation. Here you have an example from Arvin Jeans. In India, you had... Um, uh, people want to have jeans, and you can, you and I can ask if we, you don't have a whole lot of money, m lot of money, should we be using that money on jeans? Well, that's not really up to us to question, I could argue. Uh, but if you buy a normal pair of jeans in India, it would cost forty dollars, for example. Not a whole lot of money for you and I, you and I, but for a person living on four dollars a day, that's quite a lot of money. Uh, what Arvin Jeans did was rather than questioning whether or not you should have jeans or not, they, be, they said, well, what do they have? They have very good seamstress skills. They're very good at sewing. They may have time. So let's sell them packets of the jeans materials, the buttons, the zippers, in one packet for five bucks instead. That's interesting. That's an innovation in the business model of thinking, really. How can we provide that good but to a much lower cost? Uh, another example is product Project Shakti that Unilever experienced. And this was an innovation on a whole lot of different fronts. They had to uh, innovate on the detergent that they wanted to sell because if you're using uh, detergents in the water streams, you're going to have to use a very different type of product that is both sustainable, not least of all, but also gets your clothes uh, clean if you don't have a washing machine. You needed to, they wanted to get to that last mile out where you have a very different infrastructure, where you have a very difficulties in getting out. There's social, social issues where women would only buy from other women. Uh, there are so many different issues that they wanted to tackle. They had, uh, there was groups of women who had no income out at the last mile, they were organized in these what they call Project Shakti as self-help groups um, that were microfinanced. They found they had to innovate with and working with very alternative partners such as civil society organizations that are already out there rather than traditional distributors that they had to work with. So you see innovation on a whole lot of different fronts. And this is, sure, you can argue how nice is it that a Unilever, such a large 
I think it's the world's third uh, largest fast moving consumer goods company, uh, is going to make profit on this way. On the other hand, they, uh, they provided income generation, they brought, got their, their, their uh, products out to the last mile and there was, uh, in a sense, a win-win situation. So with that, I think I'm uh, past my time and uh, I look forward to listening to Olaf. Thank you very much. So listen, I'm so excited to be here and um, thank you also for having me. And um, it stro struck me, I, I guess I knew, but I didn't really think about it, that this is actually the last weekend of my exhibition. What a glorious uh, time for me to have had a show here in Stockholm. Thank you so much, everybody, for hosting me with such a graceful um, hand. Um, I've really had a fantastic time. So, of course, it's a little bit touching to end off, uh, but touching upon it, you know, or being in the context of a economic school, what a sort of leap to the next sort of step after having been there, done that with the museum, Daniel. We are so over now. Um, <laughs> and so I am so gonna uh, go into uh, economy. It so happens that I am, by all, by, 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 by it's a funny coincidence, I, I'm going to Davos next week, of all places, uh, for the World Economic Forum. So this is like a, a warm up massage uh, <laughs> today. So now I just have to think about what to say. Um, <coughs> and it's funny because. Uh, in Davos, I'm getting a prize for, um, for, and they didn't write art, because then, of course, nobody would come for my ceremony, because there's not a lot of art lovers in Davos, I can tell you that. But, but I mean, who knows, right? So anyway, I'm getting it for creating inclusive communities, and I guess that's what they think of when they think of art, which is interesting, right? So at least that's, I mean, that's something, right? They think of art as being an inclusive community. And it's so interesting, so that gives us a bit of a, a sort of a... Um, of an ambition that we have lived to live up to. We have to be, when making art and showing art and being in involved with artistic agendas, we should exercise the sort of um, the inclusive muscle. And I guess that's a nice note to start upon. Um, um, this is actually a museum. Uh, let me just show you the five pictures I show. Then I see them too, right? So this is one. 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 And then. This is the last one, I think. Oh, there's another one, and this one. Yeah. <laughs> so let's just go. No, so 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 this is a museum in England, the Tate Modern, and and uh, the Turbine Hall. <coughs> a series of exhibitions sponsored by Unilever, and they actually decided to stop that. Maybe they considered it too elitist. It's interesting, right? So that in the late '90s they started this series, huge collaboration. So I got a bit of money from Unilever and the Tate Modern hosted it and so on and so forth. What is exciting, or what was exciting for me was the opportunity to, I mean, to first of all, of course, work at the Tate and this was exciting and so on. But just this thing that the, the space, which is sort of a buffer between the outside on the Thames, on the South Bank, being still to a great extent public, and then sort of before you really get into the museum where you have the galleries and and so on and so forth, we're really in the museum. So there's this kind of semi-public square which would still be free and there is that idea that you um, sort of, you might actually go to the Tate and only go to that space because they would, not always, but sometimes it would cost you to get into the own. So and then there is a cafe and so on and so forth. So anyway, so there's this, there's this type of idea of a museum actually hosting some of what would be expected to be in a public sphere or semi-public sphere and, and this discussion the museum of course reaching out to be a participant or co-producer of the public is I think an interesting idea so I took that start and I called it the weather project addressing the fact that uh, the weather in the city co sort of constitutes a kind of idea of nature in the city and what is unique about the weather to make a long story sh a little shorter is of course that we can disagree about the weather without becoming enemies so it's a sort of a, it's a space, the weather, which can host a conflict without us actually really excluding each other. So it's a nice sort of metaphor for inclusive ideas because you speak to the taxi driver and he's actually quite happy with this weather that I'm totally not happy with, but we can still be together. And I think that as a model, this is a nice idea for a museum because I think that is a what 
museum and people like Daniel and the great team here, what they actually do, they facilitate a methodology where we are exercising, disagreeing and sharing at the same time, right? Generalizing a little bit. But, but <coughs> and, and that has even been promoted, like the goat we saw with the tie around it, right? So how can one not disagree on that? It's about, you know, how can we share or be together and disagree at the same time? So this uh, as a kind of economic model, I think that's interesting because normally the definition of success is, of course, all the people who agree, they go, well, here we make a business model. The people who don't agree or who are different, they are not welcome. We exclude them. We send them out of, of the space, out of the country, out of Europe, and, and all of these things, right? So anyway, so, so the project here was, well, do I successfully, can I successfully create a space taking on an almost public dimension? which in fact celebrates the fact that the feeling of sharing is very strong, but the acknowledgement of us having a unique or individual or different experience, all of us, is also very strong, right? So sort of an anti or counter generalizing shared experience, which is almost like a paradox, you could say. I could talk longer, but I think we just need to go on a little bit. This is now then on the top of the museum. The other one was in sort of in the front door of the museum. Uh, this is a rainbow, Aros Aarhus in Denmark. Rainbow, I say, but it's ob obviously it's just glass and steel. But on the roof, there um, they ran out of money building the museum. So 10 years later, they got a bit of money from a public-private partnership type of foundation, interestingly also. And then the, the city suggested the museum to do a kind of upgrade of their business model because they were running out of money, having not a really sophisticated restaurant and so on. Uh, the politicians said, oh, you have enough galleries. To, well, can you do something interesting? Right, so they were, do some restaurant or rent or something, spaces rent out for weddings or something. <laughs> and <laughs> luckily, the, the director at the time uh, was courageous enough, let's make more art, he said. And then he actually made a competition, which I won, suggesting another floor for art, but different types of art. And this really brought, uh, uh, it five-folded the visitors to the museum um, the first year, I don't know how it go it's going now. But anyway, so it was a lovely success, not just from the perspective of the rainbow to the city, but also the city took a degree of pride of that little bit of a landmark. And now this is a bit of ambiguous, obviously, because a landmark or the sort of the icon thinking and the branding and all of that is, a, I guess one could say, a kind of older type of economy which sort of s makes things static and non-negotiable. And as we all know, the rainbow, just like the little rainbow up above us, I guess, right there, um, is um, in fact very negotiable, right? And interestingly, as you might have noticed, we never see the same rainbow because the person over here clearly sees a different one, right? Because the drop and the eye and the light from that perspective is obviously very unique. So it's a little bit like the sun in the other space before. Anyway, so a nice example and, and one could talk a little bit about well, what does actually drive an experience? This is quite simple, to be honest. I mean, between us, it's colored glass, right? So you look out at the city through colored glass. And, and, and But what is maybe more interesting is what you do not think about, and that is to change the color, you have to walk, uh, which is so simple it goes without saying. So if people walk, so it's almost like suggesting that the seeing is with the feet, right? The ca changing colors. So the movement becomes the main protagonist. The time it takes for you to walk around and the circular movement and the process is suddenly what constitutes the success. The success is that not that one bang, right? It's not the championship of the singularity or whatever moment one could try to sell to people. It's actually the time it takes for you to walk around it. So this idea of suggesting that temporality or process is worth something, I think is a nice it's a nice uh, argument when it comes to also offering the city or this sort of idea of the public space, what is quality in public space. And as we all know, the private sector with all the economic models, by the way, have very much tried to sell us the city as a timeless concept, right? The sort of consumer-driven idea of success being timeless. This is an instant classic sort of timeless design and all of that. Anyway, Iceland, Harper. This started with a banking sector pro as a project with the lovely Ike Viking uh, maniacs uh, econ uh, sort of uh, f f finance sector in Iceland before the crisis. And I can say a lot, it's a lovely project, but 
so I did the exterior and Henning Larsen Architects, who also worked in Stockholm, did the interior and it was a lovely partnership. Um, and and by, by all means, the visionary, the kind of risk happiness of these crazy financiers uh, was the kickoff. But then the crisis came, they all went to either jail or Bermuda or Bermuda or, you know, so uh, they are, I mean, they're still kind of around, uh, but, but essentially it became overnight a public project. So it went, so it's not a public, public partnership, it's like, went from private to public, like boom, like in 2007, one late evening. So um, with regards to identity and the sort of city and the response and civic society and the relationship, one element was that obviously suddenly the Icelandic krona dropped. Or did it rise or did it drop? I'm so bad at economy. So anyway, crisis. <laughs> I think the krona dropped, right? That's how it works. So suddenly it was cheaper to buy Icelandic labor than to import the steel from Poland, right? And this was not so interesting because it's sort of how it is. But suddenly the local craftsman from Hapnerfjord down the street, he actually was doing the emergency signs, right? Suddenly he took pride in saying, oh, this is my science in the building. So he developed a sense of ownership because this was the only building project during the crisis because the only place he could get work and so on and so forth. So, so do you see the point is actually it went from being a very different project and psychologically speaking, the, the kind of everybody hated it because it was like the hu a huge tombstone celebrating the people who had so disappeared overnight, the bankers, right? But suddenly then the whole shift because of the corona meant that all the local people started working on it. It became the only place, and because there was art, and this is my punchline, because there was art involved, it kind of leaped beyond it, and they said, we are working on something impo important. It's kind of non-quantifiable, we don't know what it is, but it has to do with art. Right? Also, it's a music hall, you know, so it has to do with music, it's not just me. It's really this, let's do a great culture center, and this became a kind of, psychologically speaking, a sort of an interesting journey out of the crisis, and and worth mentioning. So in that way I've worked a lot with what is the social, si so social dynamic quality of a sense of ownership of space, whether that's private or public. This is a newly opened bridge in Denmark. As you can see, I'm trying to make it hard to get across that little bit of canal there, <laughs> suggesting that it is in fact a sort of sequence of smaller spaces, just like walking through somebody's apartment or somebody's something more intimate rather than a functional functionally optimized and as you can see you're sort of going into the water a little bit too i could go on about this as well but <coughs> so this this sort of suggestion of these kind of events or or projects or artworks or cultural muscles in public spaces what what i worked with and i chose a few of these pictures because they were different than the show i hope you'll have time to see up upstairs afterwards i brought this one because as you can see it's just down the street from here and uh, Daniel was with me, <coughs> so um, I wasn't alone. Uh, but um, essentially, um, it's non-toxic. Um, it's used to throw in oceans, and in sort of, it's used for this actually. But the point being, um, I have a few ways of talking about it. Uh, one sort of nice one is that there was an article by the police the next day, I think, in the in Dagens Nyheder, that would said that this was a non-pollutive material, because were it sweet, Stockholmers called the police, asked what on earth is wrong, and they had could calm people down telling them there was a leak in the heating system of that building on the middle there, I believe it's the parliament, right? I wonder if I have a pointer here, but but so anyway, so, so the police in that very Swedish way could sort of ease people's uh, nerves, um, keeping things under control, which is great. So on the next day, again, there was a article, uh, a sort of art critic, which um, actually could, could sort of say, no, no, it's actually a work of art by this Icelandic Danish artist and so on and so forth. And then there was a little review, and I got a really bad review for it. <laughs> it was sort of funny, uh, because uh, the review was very much, you know, suddenly talking about art as if the rest of the world wasn't existing, right? It didn't actually bring up the interesting article from the police, which I thought was interesting. If you do a review, obviously the sort of activistic aspect of it so suddenly it was more like the review of a watercolor, 
if you know what I mean. So as if it was hanging on a museum, just happened to be in Strøm. So that's also about how the art world can be incredibly closed, as Daniel talked. I worked, so I one could talk about different things too, namely when does a city become static, self-obsessed self with its own model of reality, and it forgets to renegotiate reality forgets to become a reality machine and becomes suddenly becomes like inflexible, static, exclusive, you could say. So there is that discussion. So it's like a wake up call. Hey, shh, wake up, right? Reality is right here. And, and all of that, right? Especially city regulatory sort of dimensions. Now you have this discussion about whether or not to do a big new building like for the Nobel, for instance, uh, do, do does this can the cit city actually sustain that sudden rupture of a chain? So is that not good? Do you, does a new building actually fit into that museum that you all live in here? Like, I mean, the, ci the city as such. It's a, in, it's a discussion in many cities where how do you manage the kind of progress that you also want to be a part of, of course. And the um, Louisiana Museum, do you see it's like the opposite of the Green River? That's why it's sort of fun to show. It's like exactly the other way around. So I shouldn't talk too much about it. This is Paris and um, Place de la République. Um, so the foreign officer, uh, the foreign uh, minister, um, um, went to Greenland this summer with the French ambassador uh, for Denmark, and they saw the ice. And I had done this in Copenhagen, and that's how it happened. So when there was the attacks, of course, everybody was very nervous. But interestingly, they were very focused on you know, succeeding. So there was a few changes, but this became, I think, a, a, um, a very important project for the city. And so I worked very closely with the mayor's office and with the few protagonists involved, some of which was foundation money from the, it uh, was not Bill Gates, but the uh, Bloomberg Foundation and the British Foundation who then, you know, paid for it and so on and so forth. Um, I can talk a little bit about the ice just on one account because the sustainable question and of the whole idea of the climate challenge obviously is something that I'm very interested in. And as you can see, the, the whole point is here, how does one actually develop a kind of uh, physical relationship with the climate that takes the idea of the discussion or the understanding of sustainability from, some from something intellectual and to a, great uh, to a great extent very abstract into something palpable, physical, something we can relate to, something we can negotiate to with, and, and something we actually understand as a sort of, you know, as a um, physical thing in terms of, well, when I do something, it has consequences over here. And when the consequences are that, that affects me. So that, I think, is not an intellectual idea. We understand it intellectually, but it's very important that there is a physical dimension to it. And that's, ma generally speaking, very much what this is about. As you can see, this is also, you know, I guess, you could also be talking about this ice being 15,000 years old approximately, uh, you know, to the kids at the same time as it sort of takes a day or two for it to melt. It took a week um, before it was gone. So finally, do you see that little white dot up there? That's actually an extra star, sort of called your star. So the Nobel ceremony and the Nobel was kind enough to host art. So one could talk about the artwork, which I'm happy to do. So I think it's a great artwork. So that's now that's uh, the discussion about art. But the question which is also interesting, why does the Nobel want to you know, get involved with art? Right? Why is Unilever paying Tate? Why did the Louis Vuitton uh, Foundation build uh, the most expensive museum in the world two years ago where I had the opening show? I did not show that picture, but, but you know, so, so interestingly, there is a lot of sort of relationships between the perception of institutional models, whether amazing places like the Nobel, I mean, so there's no doubt that, I mean, everybody in the world thinks it's great. The only people, have, you know, sort of reevaluating are we good enough is the Nobel themselves. Everybody else thinks they are like the best. And and I'm a, I've been involved with, um, you know, I've been involved with the UN a little bit because the UN, or I've been trying to promote that culture and access to culture is a human right. It kind of is sort of in there somewhere, but it's not exactly like real culture impact. I would say that with the cultural muscle that the culture sector, and I'm just a tiny little drop in that sector, of course, the culture sector as a space where we can host conflicts without creating exclusion, right? It's a, such an interesting idea. 
And of course, the UN still thinks it's generally, I mean, and uh, this is more complex, but you know, so instead of sending weapons and soldiers and so on, I think one should do a cultural festival. That's a very hippie uh, type of thinking. But nevertheless, frankly speaking, I'm, I'm, I think I'm onto something because talking about Congo, right? So in King Jasa, no, um, South, um, you'll come to me in a second. So, uh, so a uh, big city south of Congo. Anyway, fantastic culture festival, art festival, right? Biennale. Uh, no, no. Um, so, so they for they with private sponsors and so on. They've done a culture festival. So the culture festival has art, art festival, sort of poetry, music, dance, but also it has sort of gay, gender-based uh, discussion platforms. You know, poetry about uh, sexuality uh, and AIDS and exploitation and, and tra human trafficking and so on. Suddenly, you have a culture festival, and that's like a parliament. So. As a, as a resource, the cultural sector is, is, you know, on one end, it's something which is incredibly uh, interesting, such as a museum like this, but it is also right there on the street of a city w which names, I will say in a second, uh, but, but, um, but, and I've been trying to propose, well, you know, why don't you do, you know, conflict management using culture? I would be happy to step in and give it a shot. Um, Oh, that's uh, the Stockholm. That's the daytime, sort of when it's off. It's only on in the night, and it's called your star, because being you, being mean you being you. So, so we all get a kind of Nobel Prize. This is how the energy for the star. So the star, as you know, is a sun, right? Otherwise, it's a planet, I think. Uh, so it's actually made with. This is my studio, and this is a solar panel, and and some some green stuff on my roof. So finally, and I thought I didn't want to talk too much. This is sort of the end of my very general discussion, but this was the little little son that was mentioned. I just brought one, so I hope it's charged. Yes, it is. So there's a solar panel on the back, and this is as good as a panel gets at, at this day and age. And there's a little LED on the inside, and the LED is also, it's so funny, it's 0 0.2 cent. Then uh, Nowadays, a good LED, this is a Korean LED, this solar panel is American. The battery inside is uh, a Taiwanese uh, battery, and the plastic is a. It's uh, now, for the time being, it's. It's not German anymore, but it's a. Uh, I think it's Czech. The plastic Czech, but it's and all the parts, everything, everything is done in China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. So it's it's made in uh, China, and um, everything has been made around two criteria. One is to compete with the oil industry, so the price of oil in places like this is kerosene and the price of oil, meaning the price of kilowatt is very high, the amount of energy you get out of oil and the price is very high. So that was the ambition on one side. The other ambition was to kind of create a, a kind of emotional factor, because there's a few of these lamps already out there, right? The UN has arranged one themselves, there's, there's a few actually really great ones. This is the highest quality currently on the market. It's also the cheapest one because we are the only one who's stupid enough to not actually make money, even though that was the idea, but that has proven a little more difficult not being a business person. So there's very high quality with very little profit, essentially. So we might have to change that at some point. But nevertheless, nevertheless, the, the other was the design criteria. And because of all the other works kind of was about that, how much does the emotional response matter when you choose energy, right? That's why the design has this kind of slightly, uh, I would say, positive shape. Because if you have five lamps on a table, of course I want people to walk up and say, oh, very nice lamps, oh, but this is really sweet, right? So the kind of happiness, so could, or let's call it the cultural muscle, could the design actually take the functional aspect, and the functional has to be good, of course, so there's a 1,500 charges on a battery like this nowadays. Uh, that gives you five years of usage, so it's a five-year warranty on it with full charge. There is 120 gram of plastic in it. If anybody have a better material which can compete within that price economic model, I'm very happy to change the plastic. 120 gram of plastic is half of an oil can right, being sort of a, a sort of tomato soup can, right, so half of that is 120 gram of oil is what we have here. So if we have 1,500 cans of oil is what this represents in terms of sort of balance, so the plastic used in this, because, 
because plastic is not really environmental, I know very well. We have to compare it in the equation, so it's half a promille. Is that so? Something like that, right? Anyway, and we are building up then these business models, and I have learned a bit about b businesses myself, and uh, this, this maybe we can chat about it if it's interesting enough, but, but the point being that we have not been able to find an economic model that actually works. We are now in thir 12 uh, sub-Saharan African countries, some of which are doing really well, but there is no synchronicity between the different business models. Uh, we are very much out in what is called the last mile sort of segment because we work in rural areas, in off-the-grid areas, and we work with partnerships with all kinds of and uh, you know possible and impossible organizations. But of course, we focus on sort of microeconomical systems which would allow for local entrepreneurs to build up their own business. So the idea is you buy a little bit of money up here and the profit from that is driving the delivery of lamps at cost price in places where the profit then stays there locally. So the idea is that that should allow us not to lose money making these, which has not quite been the case yet. But anyway, the, the point is that you are in fact powering something which is then not a relief-based system but a social powered business model. Um, and we are still working on it. So probably being some of sort of business-minded or sort of, sort of studying at the great school, you should have a chat uh, with us if you have the kind of key to how to unlock this. Uh, now, anyway, we're working. I'm g this is why I'm actually going to Davos also. See, now this is um, the kind of end of uh, my short introduction. Thank you. As the title of your current exhibition, Reality Machine, implies, your artwork are often described as these machines for critically examining our relations to our environment, as sort of a tools through which the viewer becomes an active producer of reality. And in line with this interpretation, I think it's very interesting how some of your artwork, such as Ice Watch, is this better? Yeah. <laughs> how it exemplifies how, quite rather, complex objects such as climate change itself um, are do not speaking for themselves in the world, but rather have to be translated through some kind of tools. And in one way, we could say that one such of that tools is your re reality machines, which makes us co-produce understandable realities with our senses and through sensuous experiences. In other words, one could say that what your works are actually enable us to do is to understand both ourselves and our world through what we could call sense-making. Equivalently, Lynn, scientists such as yourself also have sort of your, your tools, such as measurement instruments for which abstract global challenges such as climate change are also translated. But in your case, it's often translated into facts, to information, which after validation processes, interpretation and so forth becomes some kind of scientific knowledge. One could say that if you, Oliver, is engaged in what we could call then sense-making, you are involved in making sense of the world. So with this short little background, I would like to ask both of you, how does science and art differ in their task of translating the world? And in what ways do you think that the combination of sense-making on the one hand and making sense on the other hand can contribute to sustainable action? <laughs> You can start you if you yeah, want. no, so I think actually uh, the ice was interesting. The funny thing is the ice is actually so simple, right? So it doesn't need a lot with regards to the actual project. So bring ice from Greenland and try to do it in a, in a relatively un not so pollutive way, which is, you know, almost impossible. But essentially that is one element of it. But the, the sort of the, the hospitality of the space is a you know, underestimated co-producer of this event. So let me just say, if it was in a supermarket, right, if it was in Le Bon Marché, uh, you know, this sort of fancy mall where, um, which, which is, uh, you know, in Paris is amazing, right? So it's like, if it was there, it would somehow have been different, right? And we kind of underestimate how amazing something public can be and what type of resource that is with regards to, you know, sharing an experience. So this piece, I'm probably drifting off your question a little bit. But so, so I'm just saying, I'm just sort of trying to put some of the success of the physical encounter with the ice to something which is a little more complex. We could call it the milieu or the sort of 
the much bigger thing than actually touching the ice. The smart is, you know, if you go to eat Greenland, it's not so, I mean, it's also fun to touch the ice first time, but in Paris, you kind of, you sort of hug the ice because it's so weird to see the ice in Greenland, to see the rocks inside of Louisiana or so. And then you, we all know France being a republic, you know, public means something else. I mean, so, so also in Sweden, but you know, in Paris, it's, they're so proud of, you know, not having a, so no offense, but you know, so you know how <laughs> I mean, so, it's like, so this is, so this is a part of it. It's very interesting. Um, what I guess I'm trying to say is that there is a, an element in this which is very hard to quantify or verbalize, which and one should not be afraid of trying to verbalize it or make it scientific. I think culture is robust enough to go through the quantifiable sort of machine of the McKinsey uh, sector, right? And still come out robust enough. I don't think, I'm not afraid of working with Louis Vuitton because I think I'm so much stronger than they are. You know, they are not, I'm not them asking, I'm not asking them, they are asking me because it's very clear who has, you know, the long end on this. So in the long run, so, um, but you talk about McKinsey here that are actually producing facts and reports about, for example, climate change. You also talk about the physical experience of, of being there and touching the ice and so forth. Could one say then that, that the actual um, the task of translating the world from McKinsey's side is to get the facts on the table, while what you are doing is actually trying to embody that experience to gain action? Or well, uh, my role is also a little bit to criticize the sort of the success criteria that the kind of and I know nothing about McKinsey really, <laughs> but you know, the, the general knowledge I have which suggests that, that they work with very static success criteria and there is very little process uh, sort of monitoring and so on. So I was at MIT teaching about, you know, energy uh, at a Tata workshop. So this is where artists go, right? When they don't make art, they go to MIT, work with in engineers teaching solar <laughs> energy, like totally <laughs> off the track. <laughs> so anyway, so there was this study that was done for UI US aid by McKinsey, uh, uh, whether uh, so solar products like this was successful. And, you know, then there was like, a very systematic study on success criteria of impact, you know, impact solar products and how much money, oil, and all of that, right? And it was great. It was like I was like, wow, this is amazing. But there was like one, uh, there was like one thing which was not in this huge survey, which was to guide how the USAID, which is as you know, the ones who spent more money than Bill Gates on <laughs> on aid, uh, how to buy solar lamps. And of course, that's the question I had: how, why don't they buy my lamp? And that was. The emotional response to, I mean, how does it feel to live with a solar lamp in your house? See, now that was not in the survey. What do people, f wh what do they think about having, you know, a solar powered LED in there? And what does that feel like? And that's, of course, the questions that the cultural sector is working with. So, the point is, I think there is a shortcoming on, on sort of, f f you know, understanding what is really the the how do you create unique solutions to a very very diversified need and i guess need is not the word one uses anymore but you know uh, and and this is where i think cultural strategies have very high ability to uh, sort of go in and do tailor made solutions so what is our problem is maybe also our success we don't have a business model that is one model for many countries it turns out that well we wish we did but it turns out our success is a new model, even within the same country, we're working with two or three different models parallel. Mm. Uh, and that seems to be the strategy. It's a polyphonic sort of uh, non-quantifiable, uh, uh, it's just totally non-McKinsey, you could say. Mm. Yeah, uh, I, I actually think when you ask the question of going back to whether or not artists are in the business of sense making and scientists in the business of making sense, I'm actually thinking, I think we do both. I think though that we may have different tools of uh, coming out. We, we, may, we may have the same goal in, in a sense, but we have different tools of uh, our result. Uh, I think what artists, what I mean, w you need some type of sense making to be interested in doing the research that you do. How do you mean? Right. You need to understand in the same way as uh, as artists need to understand what is it that they want to show with the, the ice watch. That is based on some type of understanding of the world. So you've made sense of that, and then how do we then 
reach people or have an impact on people. And that can be different types of people. It can be uh, the, the, the child on the street who is meeting the, the ice, or it can be other researchers, or it can be other artists, or musicians, or, or what have you. But you want to reach someone in some way. And I think that uh, researchers, what we, w we're pretty good at putting up graphs, and we're pretty good at crunching the numbers. We're pretty good at being able to show, you know, tediously good at being able to, <laughs> to show the stats of it all. I don't think what we're very good at is actually having the impact to, to, uh, uh, to gain action, to gain the, you know, the agency to feel that this is something that I can do about. I, I think a lot about, and I think it was uh, my colleague Tinney who brought that up as a, a great example. If you think of the picture of uh, Ilan, uh, on the shores, and you saw the reaction to the world on, you know, wanting to do something about this. It may have not l have lasted, un unfortunately, very long, but everyone knew that there were 60 million refugees out there. No one really felt that they had any connection to that. But to be able, and, and what I think art is so much better at, is being able to touch the heart more so than just the, the intellect, intellect and the brain, in a sense, because I don't think, I think that you need both, but I think you, you if without the heart, without the, that feeling of engagement and that this is something that actually matters to us, I don't think there's a whole lot of agency and a whole lot of action that will happen. So I, I don't see art and, and science, in a sense, as necessarily very opposite. I think we need both if it is in the question of actually getting uh, engaging human beings. What would you say about that, um, Olaf? Once you wrote that, I think that art is the key and science is the tool to gain action. Are we, do we have to internalize this, this knowledge in order to, to do something about these global challenges that we face today? Well, I think. I think the cultural sector is is uh, something which can adapt to a lot of different things, and sometimes culture just should be culture for the sake of culture, and that has a longer, you know, in a longer perspective, it will then be, you know, maybe or will not be beneficial. But it's not about that. I, or in order to be successful, it does not need to be functionalized. But culture can easily also be added to, um, you know, a communicational perspective. A good way of investigating this is you know i was so excited about being a sort of a part of the cop 20 cop uh, event in, in paris and that that whole you know sort of group group dynamic was very interesting you know being within the context of something but one could also say had that but not been a climate crisis but let's just think about that for a second it's so funny but you know had that not been it would still be a great work of art it would still be interesting and the kids would still be like wow eyes and you know it would still work so that's somehow an indicator when is art just a communication prop but anyway i generally speaking i think one should not make rules about when is success is when is art art and when it's not art because it always turns out that this is you know for sure we're going to prompt an artist to break that rule immediately so i do think that we should see the cultural sector as a resource which is able to communicate in ways which are much more touching and moving than communication often in general is. So look at the media. So we know everything about the world. We know everything about the climate, by the way. Nobody knows what is what one needs to know. And still to translate that knowledge into action, and, and, and you know, uh, that is so difficult. Um, <coughs> and 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 this is why I'm very interested in the sort of the psychology of what is the difference between knowing something and doing something what's the distance and actually it turns out that the distance is much think bigger than we think so we and science can be an answer to bridge the two because science is of course very good with organizing things but science i think is looking at the very same question essentially behavioral science or so social sciences well wh how come people see other people suffering and then they are not emotionally touched right it's very interesting uh, and i guess that one can conclude that people are numb, right? So the numbification of our societies. So which sector is going to be counter numbifying? Is it the economic or finance sector? I think that is the one who predominantly has made us numb. So, uh, but you know, McKinsey they very often turn over like that. So they might. I think we should expect the solutions from the people, the very same brilliant people who invented the you know the coal industry. 
I mean, they were they were good scientists, right? So they, they the, the, the whole, you know, the everything that is polluting was made by brilliant scientists. Let's just face it. They should now they will invent, in, invent all the answers. So I don't think we should sort of polarize. But to get back, I think col the culture sector is one of the de elements in our society which is denomifying because it works with a lot of criteria which has not yet been successfully organized by the traditional industries or, or, so, or, or sort of sectors. And um, I really like that. I mean, th that the cultural sector can help to denumify because we are washed over with data, with statistics. We know intellectually what's going on, but we don't feel it. And I think that's what culture can and art can do. It can make us feel. Yes. And that can make us act. And of course, the educational sector is sort of right there with the cultural sector, especially kids and children and all of that. So culture and education should and, and you know, to a great extent to be interlocked. But, but, but I think it, it's a little bit both about the denomification, if that's what we're calling it, but it's also about how to inspire, to uh, inspire people to act. And, and of course, um, that needs, so the culture sector can also learn something. How do we take and turn people from being consumers into being you know, agents or producers? Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and, I, and I guess that is where uh, probably you know, economical models and the culture sector should maybe collaborate. How do we prevent people from coming to a museum like this, thinking that they are about to you know, take in an uh, exhibition? pre-digested by some <laughs> authority called the art institution, how do we create the sort of the belief system where people think and they come and they think, now I am going to be creative, I'm going to be an artist, I become a producer, I become a reality machine. So in my title of the show, Reality Machines, I didn't say it was my works. You know, of course, that's what people think, and so maybe I was not really clear. Uh, but the, tri the trick is we are all reality producers. The reality machine could also be the visitor. That's why, why, that's the question you asked I never answered, uh, that why do I call people, you know, why is it machines? I call my artworks machines just to sort of demystify them and make people think that they are in fact the, or at least they are the co-producer of the artistic potential. Mm. Or without the people, there's no artistic potential. I'm not saying the machines doesn't have an agency or sort of, you know, do you remember some of you, Timothy Morton was here, so, you know, it's very interesting. Um, he would have a different take of this, which I think is great. But so, um, so calling it a machine allows the audience to be the spirit, right? Mm. If there is a spirit in uh, this day and age. Mm. Well, we're going to move on here to another question. That's more regarding the knowledge aspects of of, of creating this change. Um, because once upon a time there was this German sociologist and philosopher, I think he's dead now, Jürgen Habermas, who defined three different knowledge interests for which we generate knowledge. Did he die? He's not dead. Is he dead? No, he's not dead. Okay. Dan sorry. Is <laughs> Habermas dead? No, no, he's, he's very, not. He just wrote in the paper I'm the other day. I'm terribly sorry. No, it's okay. He just <laughs> made a fool no. of myself. Yeah. Here I am. I mean, he's old, but he's not dead. <laughs> <laughs> Almost dead. <laughs> Anyhow, the good old but not yet dead Jürgen Habermas. <laughs> Defined. Three different knowledge interests mm -hmm. who's still alive through which you generate knowledge. One of them is the technical interest that generates knowledge that seeks to explain the world. It's often done by these causal explanations and empiric methods, which is often typical for the natural sciences, for example, and it's often a knowledge that we would prefer to as being the truth. We have the practical interest that generates knowledge that seeks to give an understanding through interpretation, which is often the case when we try to interpret a work of art, for example. And if the technical interest generates knowledge that seems to explain the world, and if the practical interest generates knowledge that seeks to give an understanding of the world, the emancipatory interest generates knowledge that seeks to change the world. And in one way or another, try to liberate us from institutional for its for forces that limit ourselves. And that's being done through uh, criticism and self-reflection and so forth. So returning to my, my rather lucid interpretation of your work, Icewatch, um, I would say that we could see signs of all these interest there in one way or another. It explains climate change. You talk about how we could feel a causal, you know, relation between touching something, it touches you back, and you get an understanding of how this climate change actually uh, works, so to speak. It is a piece that uh, encourages interpretation and a further understanding as well, I would say, of 
um, our place and our relations to climate change as such, but it also actually seeks to actively change the world through encouraging climate action, and not just any climate action, but a sort of a political action. Mm. It's based in COP21, where the politicals are gathering to make these uh, very big decisions for our world, so it actually has this political dimension as well. So my question to you, Alin, is what knowledge interest drives each one of you, and in what kind of knowledge do you think that we are in the most need of today uh, in order to create a more sustainable society? I want to save the world. I think we all do. <laughs> um, yeah, me too. Yeah. Yeah, I think. I mean, I, it <laughs> sounds <laughs> off. It sounds yeah. really cliche, uh, yeah. but somewhere I think we all of us have an idea with you know why why it's worthwhile to get up in the morning, to uh, work very long hours, which I'm sure uh, Olaf probably works even longer hours than I do. Um, but there, there is at the end of the day, either it's with your children or it's uh, with what you do, that there is some feeling of wanting to save the world in that tiny way that you yourself can contribute to. Um, and, and honestly, working with uh, the companies, and I, I'm very lucky because I get to work with some of the leading companies who have taken sustainability uh, really to its heart, but not, not only in a, from a business perspective, but also because I think there are more business leaders than you believe that also want to save the world <laughs> uh, in, in some way. Um, to, be, to be totally honest, I'm very, very disappointed with a lot of our politicians. So I'm not looking to the politicians to really save the world. Uh, I would have actually more trust in uh, long-term uh, companies that are taking a very long stance and seeing the importance uh, also being an actor in their role in society. I actually have more uh, trust in that than I do, in, unfortunately, in our policymakers and regulators. Mm. So would you say that we have enough facts now? Do we have enough understanding? Uh, no, I guess we have enough facts around climate change that the fact is, you know, these are the things that are going on. Uh, we don't think we have enough facts or research in, you know, the best way of solving it. Mm. And I think that we still need, but the focus is more on how should we do this in the best way because, uh, and, and why I think also it's incredibly important that one works together across dif different disciplines, either it's art and economy or the natural sciences or sociology or political science or philosophy, because all of the issues that we have today are so complex and so interrelated, uh, interlinked with each other, and everything, mm -hmm. every effect or every change that you make within one group of people or organizations or phenomena or wha whatever you want to call it will have another effect or cause or effect in another part so it's so interlinked and we need it all it's so complex that we need it all together so going back to the main the question ar around taking action through art and economy then would you say that the role of the scientist or the research is actually moving away from creating these facts and information or trying to get an understanding moving more towards politics trying to change the world and transform it no, I, I think we still, we, we all have to do in, in some way what we're best at. And uh, I think researchers are very good at bringing up the facts. Uh, they may not be very good at disseminating the, the consequences and implications uh, of those facts, but I think we need far much more research on how to solve the problems that we have. So uh, rather than whether or not it is a problem, we still need a lot of research on how the best way is uh, to solve these complex issues that we have. Well, sir, take on that over. No, I, I, I think it's such an interesting question. So the city I was trying to remember before was Lubumbashi in, the, in Congo, and uh, it's a fantastic city. The curator there is Sami Balochi. So he's an artist and all, and sort of a cultural event organizer. Uh, Sammy Bellotti I got to know because of Rolex. It's kind of interesting in this context. <laughs> so Rolex asked me to work a little for them, and then they introduced me to Sammy, which has become a great friend. So it's interesting. Why is it worthwhile for Rolex to introduce me to Sammy? Right? That's a good question. It's because Rolex are thinking about the future, clearly, mm -hmm. about their brand. And I'm benefiting because I get to meet Sammy. So, in so, so 
the complexity of it is of course when we have access to the knowledge that you talked about and that the idea of the Habermas, you know, we we what I said in the beginning is the generalization that there is the kind of intellectual knowledge and the physical knowledge. Of course, the truth is that there is a much stronger relationship. We kind of just just don't nurture the relationship between the intellectual knowledge, you know, what we read and what we do, right? But the of course it's there and, and, and this is how the world is. So one could maybe think that building up more and more intellectual knowledge we actually store a sort of something, right? Let's call it a trauma, right? We are gradually, step by step, under the safe heaven of nomification, being traumatized, right? And there is that one moment where a trigger kicks you out of the trauma, which was the second element of the Habermas idea. There is suddenly a movement. And a lot of people have stored up enough trauma is not the right I just can't think of anything else but enough sort of substance in in knowledge that we feel in despair we feel disconnected we feel alienated marginalized we feel you know uh, suppressed and 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 uh, this is maybe naive but you know sometimes you walk up to a painting and then you realize looking at the painting you say oh this is exactly how I feel the painting is actually looking at that stored mass of knowledge in my body and suddenly I see or I feel the painting is in fact seeing me I am being reflected by the painting and suddenly I feel included I feel seen I feel dependent you know I, mean I feel a part of something and I say to myself I am being heard I'm worth something I'm not useless I'm actually great I'm a protagonist I'm an empowering system I'm actually capable of changing the world so uh, talking about changing the world, right? So, so <laughs> the point is that I I think there is you know uh, you know uh, an interesting question: what is the trigger? Where people f say, uh, I feel included, and uh, so that's an interesting economic model. What model suddenly makes people feel? Um, what model does not act on the expense of somebody else? Talking about McKinsey, right? Which conspicuous system in the economy does not, you know, work with the idea that I buy this so I do not look like you, right? It's not saying that I have to look like you because we know that also did not work. But the point is, what, what, how do we say make a system which does not act on the expense of somebody but on behalf of something, right? So of course I have the answer here, mm -hmm. but I'm not I'm not sure <laughs> it's, it's the full th answer. But but do you, do you see the principles? So that's why I said a space which can host a conflict without leading to the exclusion. With how do you create a space? And this is interesting for parliamentary questions, for kind of political systems, and for democracy in general. How do you create a space which does not organize it itself on the expense but on behalf? And 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 um, and I'm very curious about. Sometimes I feel, you know, when reading a book, suddenly you go like, "Oh bloody hell! That act, that person in the book is me. I am. I, it's like a mirror. I, this is exactly how I feel. Except I had just not come to the point of verbalizing it yet. The book verbalized me for me. I was mirrored. I guess you call it in psychology. Mm -hmm. I was reflected, and that must be." That's maybe the strongest thing about you know the cultural sector, a local theatre somewhere up north in Sweden where people go like, oh, exactly, this is exactly how I feel. It's not about reading something about yourself outside of yourself. It's about reading something inside of yourself, which this great Nobel guy also said something. You said so, so art is about you know understanding oneself, and science is about understanding the world. Um, there's some truth to that. So is it that trigger you're looking for? That very that kind of uh, piece to develop that kind of system when you go into Davos and uh, when you think that Code 21, when you start your businesses, when you do your orphanages, uh, etc. Yeah, it's a little more complex. I don't think there is a. I'm looking for the sort of the, the sort of uh, phenomenons of these triggers because I don't think it's one uh, as such. I go to Davos. I go as a you know I represent the cultural sector and there's like two of us, uh, me and Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> and, and, we, and we represent the fact that, that culture actually is a muscle, a very small one. <laughs> I mean, his, his muscle is not small, uh, clearly, but, you know, but essentially, uh, so I'm in good company. Um, no, so it's a little more complex, but, you know, by all means, um, 
I have always pr- <laughs> I've always supported this. The, the, there is a sort of resp- I, I think I'm, re- I'm more responsible when I go out of the art world and into uh, out of my safe heaven and make a fool of myself you know trying to talk to people who are really also amazing one has to say and and you know trying to also suggest that well the cultural machine but we also forget you know there's more people working in the cultural sector than in the car industry in Europe there's more jobs created in the cultural sector than in the car industry. There's more turnover. There's more money made. There's a, so, I mean, we always think the cultural sector is some kind of side kick to society. <laughs> it's like such, and think about the whole idea of identity, right? Sort of, who's going to come up with great cr- answers to, you know, the um, immig- immigration? Well, who's going to make models which actually integrate people, right? Clearly, we failed. I mean, we, being a product of our times, when there was immigration in the 50s and 60s and 70s, but it was not really, it was not so bad, but it also did not really work. So bi- Sweden built, is that a million or was it two million houses because to kind of host all this? So the biggest ghetto um, machine in the world is Sweden. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> no, I it's think not true, but... Yeah. I think we don't get much more time now, but uh, at least we can conclude that uh, the two of you actually art and science or whatever it is have sort of uh, the same ambitions here. So um, if you would like to join the world of economy, I think Lars is, uh, could sign up <laughs> on that. We more than you're more than welcome to uh, yeah be an active professor or something like that at the Stockholm School of Economics. Yeah. <laughs> so yes. thank you very much. Thank you also. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.